So we're not borrowing unsecured funds. We can. We can borrow unsecured funds legally, but I don't do it. I don't teach it. I don't recommend it. If you are a private lender, if you are a real estate investor borrowing the funds, always give the private lender a mortgage or deed of trust, and that is going to protect them. That's their only legal recourse that they've got when they've investing. Also, how else do we protect the private lenders? We name our private lenders as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. So when we get insurance on the property, of course, we're always going to get insurance on the property. The private lender is named as the mortgagee, which means if there is a claim against that insurance policy for that particular property or house, well, when the insurance company makes a cuts a check for that insurance claim, not only is my company, the real estate investor, the borrower named on that check, but the mortgagee, the lender, is also named on that check, which means the private lender has got to sign off on that check before the real estate investor borrower can cash it. Well, that's another layer of protection for the private lender. In addition to that, we name the private lender as an additional insured on the title policy so that in the case of if there's ever a uh, title issue down the road, then the private lender is protected as well. So bottom line, we give all the same protections to our private lender as a bank would require if they were loaning money out for a mortgage. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. I had lost my line of credit. I'd been shut down, no notice. It sure would have been nice if somebody from the bank had called me and told me that I'd lost my line of credit. Had nothing to do with my credit score. In less than two weeks, I was introduced to this world of private money and private lending. I'd never heard about it. And so I put my private lending program together, that being my program that I would offer and teach people in my center of influence, how they could get high rates of return safely and securely. So I was able to create many win-win scenarios. I was able to raise and attract $2,150,000 in less than 90 days of losing my line of credit. Now that was Jay Connor. Stay with me on this one. I know it's a little bit different because we are actually gonna be talking about raising funds for single family homes, which is not something that we really typically cover on the Limited Partner Podcast. But I was on Jay's show maybe a month or so back and we had a great conversation and his story really resonated with me and it reminded me a lot of my story kind of growing up in the single family market and one of the things that really resonated with me about jay's story is his care and diligence about taking money from his investors so i wanted to bring jay on to have a conversation about what that means to him and what that looks like and how you can take that information and be a better investor with it. So stay tuned, enjoy the show. This is Jay Connor. The limited partner shares in the potentially outsized returns of a well-planned and executed investment, but as a passive investor and has the maximum leverage on their most precious asset, their time. And that is why we're here together. 90% of the millionaires out there built their net worth with real estate. However, 0% of the billionaires are hands-on managing the real estate assets because there simply isn't enough time. My name is Jake Wiley, and for the past 16 years, I've been investing in real estate, and I've learned a thing or two. But the most important lesson is how to leverage the expertise and time of others to maximize your investment potential. Welcome to the Limited Partner Podcast. All right, partners, welcome. It's your host, Jake Wiley. This week, I'm joined by Jay Connor, and I actually had the pleasure of being on Jay's podcast probably a month or so back. So 
you're out there and you're looking for a little bit different angle, uh, love for you to check that out. And Jay, I'll let you talk about your your podcast. But Jay and I have really similar backgrounds. We started investing pre-2008 and both lived through an, an incredible cycle of you're, there's money, let's go buy real estate, there's financing to a period where there was no money, uh, <laughs> no financing, the banks cut us off, and we were both forced to go raise private money, you know, reach out and, and find folks that are didn't want to be in the stock market, were looking for an outlet, and invested through a really interesting cycle. And I think that this show is going to be very timely because we are at the beginning or kind of in the throes of another very interesting cycle. And Jay and I have both lived through it. Um, but this week, you know, Jay is going to tell us a little bit about his backstory. And then we're going to get into some of the, the pros and cons of investing right now and then how to do it right. But Jay, welcome to the show. Jake, thank you for having me come on and have the opportunity to talk about my most favorite subject and what I'm most passionate about. And of course, that's private money and private lending. So thank you for having me on. Yeah, this is going to be a really fun show and super timely, like I mentioned before. But Jay, for those of my listeners out there that don't know you, I'd love to give you a few minutes. Let's let's talk about your backstory. Let's let's talk. Let's go back to when it started and bring us up to date and to where we are today. Sure. Well, my wife Carol Joy and I we've been investing in single family houses uh, since 2003. So we've been doing this for a couple of decades, and uh, we're here in Eastern North Carolina. Our target market is only 40,000 people. We do two to three deals a month, uh, single family houses. Um, most of them are funded with private money. We do some creative financing as well, but most of them are funded with private money. And our average profit right now with a median price point of $300,000, we are profiting $78,000 average on per house transaction that we do. So from 2003 until 2009, the first six years that we were in the business, all I knew to do was to go to the local bank, traditional mortgages, and uh, borrow money from the local bank to fund our deals. That's all I knew to do. Well, in January of 2009, I remember it just like it was yesterday. I uh, called up my banker. I had two houses under contract to uh, get funded and each of these houses or combined these two houses the profit was going to be over one hundred thousand dollars on these two houses and i called up my banker he and i had had this conversation many many times uh over these initial first six years and i told him where the houses were located the funding that was required uh, to fund the deals and i learned very very quickly jake uh, on that telephone conversation that i had lost my line of credit I'd been shut down, no notice. My first thought was, you know, it sure would have been nice if somebody from the bank had called me and told me that I'd lost my line of credit. Had nothing to do with my credit score. I had an 800 credit score, still got a fantastic credit score. And uh, I didn't know that we were having a global financial crisis until now I've got a crisis and <laughs> didn't have a way to fund these deals. And so I hung up the phone. And I'll tell you, Jake, my definition of coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. In less than two weeks, I was introduced to, the, to this world of private money and private lending. I'd never heard about it. And um, so I put my private lending program together, that being my program that I would offer and teach people in my center of influence, people I go to church with, people that you know I interact with. I would teach them what private money is how they could get high rates of return safely and securely. Uh, I put on my teacher hat and I started teaching people here in the local area what self-directed IRAs are and how they can move a portion or all of their retirement funds over to a self-directed IRA company. And then they could actually lend money out to me on my real estate deals, earning high rates of return safely and securely, all secured and backed by the real estate that we were investing in. So I was able to create many win-win scenarios. I was able to raise and attract $2,150,000 in less than 90 days of uh, losing my line of credit. So since that time, 
Right now, we've got about eight and a half million dollars in private money available that we use on different deals. We've got 47 private lenders, individuals, human beings just like us that are, are investing in our deals, getting a high rate of return. And so it's just been the biggest blessing in disguise since we've been in the uh, single family house investing business. Biggest blessing in disguise was losing our line of credit. In fact, that first 12 months the, after losing our line of credit, our business tripled because back then we had all the foreclosures that were hitting the market. Banks were not lending money, but we had all this private money available. And so we're actually able to triple our business by having private money available and uh, being able to buy all those foreclosures. So, you know, if it weren't for that big blessing in disguise, Jake, you and I wouldn't even be here visiting today. Yeah, I think that I love your story because I know we talked about this a little bit on on your podcast, but it's the exact same thing that happened to me. Overnight, you got nothing, right? <laughs> your whole business model is turned upside down and, and, and you're forced to go out and do something differently. And, and it, it, you know, for me, probably like you, obviously, it helped me to think bigger and better, right? And And, and be more... I guess, in the market at that point in time. But it is, a, you know, I think we're in an interesting time because you're right. Like at that point in the, the, the history of the world, you could go out and find houses left and right because there were foreclosures and they are, we're not seeing that in the current market yet. And I think that, you know, a lot of what we talk about on the show is, is commercial. And I'm predicting that we're going to start seeing that. And we're starting to see the headlines come through of, of some pretty significant, you know, keys being turned over. Uh, one of the largest asset owners in the world turned over keys for over a billion dollars in loans. Um, just last week in Texas, you know, large multifamily just went into foreclosure over $350 million. It's coming, guys. And I think that what's important to know is how to invest through these these periods. And what I'm really excited, you know, Jay, about this conversation is is talking through that. You know, you and I have both lived through a cycle. We've both invested through a cycle. We both we're both better from that. But now, you know, we're, we're in a period where, you know, I've got folks calling me up and asking me, like, "Hey, you know, I, my deal's going bad. The distributions that I was expecting have disappeared." As a matter of fact, I think they're going to start asking, you know, for capital calls, or we might have to turn these keys back over. What should we do? So, you know, I'd love to get your perspective. Is one that one that lives the you know lives it. You actually do this. You're not just a teacher, but you're also teaching future Jay Connors and Jake Wiley's out there how to raise money. And we're in an interesting market now. And I'd love to get your perspective. And you know what what are you doing yourself? And what are you teaching your students about taking people's money at this point and then actually putting it to work? Well, I'm glad you asked, Jake, because in this world of private money, I mean, all 47 of uh, our private lenders that are investing with us and have been for years, um, they are really relying on me to protect them. They're really relying on me to um, be conservative, you know, with their with their investment. I'm, you know, I'm very blessed to say. Not one of my private lenders has lost one penny. They've gotten every dollar that was due to them since we started investing. And so the question really comes up is how do, you know, there's two sides of the coin. You've got the borrower, the real estate investor, and then you have the private lender themselves that are investing. You know, how do we make sure that everybody's protected. And of course, yes, there's risk in anything that you do, but you want to hedge, you know, against that. So first of all, whether we're in a hot market or we're in a slow market, it doesn't matter. First of all, always have a very, very conservative loan to value. So let me explain what that means. So a conservative loan to value means how much are we borrowing? How much are you as a private lender lending on a deal? And my rule of thumb is I do not allow my private lenders and investors 
to loan more than 75% of the after-repaired value on a single-family house. Now, most of the private money deals that we do are in the world of single-family houses. So most of the time, there is a rehab or renovation that's involved. So, for example, if I am uh, borrowing money on a after-repaired value of $200,000 on a single-family house, I'm not going to borrow more than 150000 And the reason for that is I want to protect my private lender, my private lenders. There's a $50,000 cushion between the value of that house as to when I put it on the market for sale and the amount of money that I'm borrowing. All right. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. Make sure that it is a conservative loan to value. The second thing that comes to mind is when if you're if you are a private lender and you're loaning money on a single family house, we call it one offs, right? You have syndication where a uh, operator will raise money for a fund, and you'll have you know um, a number of private lenders, investors that invest in that fund. Well, the way I do the business is everything we do is what's called one-offs. We have a private lender or maybe a couple of private lenders that are loaning money on a particular single-family house. When we do one-offs, we always give a deed of trust or mortgage, depending on where the property is located and what state. So we're not borrowing unsecured funds. We can. We can borrow unsecured funds legally. But I don't do it. I don't teach it. I don't recommend it. If you are a private lender, if you are a real estate investor borrowing the funds, always give the private lender a mortgage or deed of trust, and that is going to protect them. That's their only legal recourse that they've got when they've investing. Also, how else do we protect the private lenders? We name our private lenders as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. So when we get insurance on the property, of course, we're always going to get insurance on the property. The private lender is named as the mortgagee, which means if there is a claim against that insurance policy for that particular property or house, well, when the insurance company makes a cuts a check for that insurance claim, not only is my company, the real estate investor, the borrower named on that check, but the mortgagee, the lender is also named on that check, which means the private lender has got to sign off on that check before the real estate investor borrower can cash it. Well, that's another layer of protection for the private lender. In addition to that, we name the private lender as an additional insured on the title policy so that in the case of if there's ever a uh, title issue down the road, then the private lender is protected as well. So bottom line, we give all the same protections to our private lender as a bank would require if they were loaning money out for a mortgage. You made some really great points in there too that I want to highlight a little bit is that there are a lot of things that you can do or get by with without doing is probably the better better way to put it. But when when you think about it, like for me, I'll, I'll put my put my own hat on here. When I was taking you know borrowing private monies and doing the same thing for for single family houses and multifamily houses, I wanted my private lenders to be so protected and so comfortable in the deal that if anything went wrong, like there were just there's a cascading event of effects that they were always a part of the, the conversation. Now, I didn't have to do that, like you mentioned, and a lot of times my private lenders didn't even know that that was actually there. Even if I explained it to them, they didn't even really know what it meant. And I think that that's that's interesting, and even when you take this to the commercial level, there are a lot of things that you should be thinking about, like what is is your security, right? When you put the money in the deal, what is the security? Is it the asset? Or are you just basically putting money into a fund? So, you know, when you put the money into the fund, the fund buys the asset, right? And then it has a loan. So you're typically sitting in second place behind the loan. And I think what's what's kind of interesting to you is that where people are getting in trouble in the commercial space is all about the loans, right? Because the loans have all the power and they get this 
these bridge loans, and this is not really something that you have to worry too, too much about in, in the resi space, especially if you're flipping and you're turning it quick. But these loans, you know, they may have a three-year, five-year expiration date on them. And they were purchased at, you know, 3% interest rates back in the day, and the rates have risen. And they might have adjustable rates in there, or they might just be terming out, right? So it's time to refinance. And the banks are looking at these things similar to how we invested back in 2008, 2009. And the banks just are saying, no, we're not taking that risk anymore. So it's just a totally different, you know, ball of wax where we are now. But you listener out there that is thinking about putting money into it, you, you really do need to understand, like Jay mentioned, what is your security? What happens if, you know, what, you know, what happens if the syndicator disappears or, you know, he leaves, like who owns the property? What happens if there's a fire, or a catastrophe? Like what happens with the insurance money? Those are all like really, really great questions. And especially in this, in, in this current economic environment, being conservative is, is the name of the game. And I think the other bridge is that let's go back in time, two years, like this cushion, you know, this 25% cushion that you, you had, a lot of these syndicators, they didn't have any. Right. The, the, the margin was, you know, a point or two, right. Cause you were buying at market and just hoping for the best and cash flows are raising. Like, so it didn't really exist and it, it's starting, it's starting to come back. You're going to start to see some margins, but Jay, what else, what else are you teaching, especially folks that are getting into the market today that are going to take other people's money? Right. Are you looking at the personalities and saying like, Hey, <laughs> you need to have some humility. And understand that you, you are you are not without fault or like how do you help people like that yeah so you know when a private lender is investing what that private lender is really investing in is the operator <laughs> the decision maker right they're looking to uh they're looking to the person that is actually you know deciding on what what that money is going to be invested in. So since that's the case, then the operator, the borrower, the real estate entrepreneur really better have their math and their formula dialed in on really what, you know, what is the value of that asset? What is the value of that property? And you know, that's for one reason that we don't borrow more than 75% of the after repaired value. But, you know, are you doing business with a person that knows that it is the math that makes the decision and not the emotions of a deal? That's one of the first lessons that I learned 20 years ago. It's got to be the math that makes the decision. For example, when I'm paying all cash, meaning I'm borrowing private money, when I'm paying all cash for a property, then, I mean, in today's market, Jake, I tell you, I'm buying houses right now at 30 and 40 and 50% of the after repaired value. And, you know, Murphy lives in every property. And you know who Murphy is. Sometimes Murphy shows up. Sometimes Murphy's cousins and aunts and uncles shows up as well. So you want to make sure as a private lender that you're doing business with someone that has got, um, you know, has got the experience and knows exactly what's the maximum uh, amount that they should be paying for a property. Uh, you know, sometimes new real estate investors allow the emotions to get involved and they just want that first deal so bad. Um, so, you know, know that you're doing business with what I call a conservative operator. I love that point. And I think harkens back to my, my investing. One of the best words I ever learned when I was investing was the word next. And it was, you know, you make an offer and you make the numbers work. And if they don't work, you just move on to the next one. And it's a volume game. And that's just the way it is. And like, you have to be out there working, working, you know, fill in the top of the funnel with opportunities, but you make your offers and if they don't work, you just move on to the next one. And it, to your point, like, it's very easy to, you know, look at a house and, you know, go, oh, this is going to be amazing. Or look at a property and like, oh, I see it. You know, like I, this, I really want this one. And for me, just getting to the point where it's like, we make our offer and we move. Right. And if we're ready to write the check 
And if they're not going to take the check, then we just move on to the next one. So Jay, let, let's talk a little bit about volume. Cause I think that's a really, probably another angle is that, you know, you're not winning all the deals that you get and you're probably looking at a ton. Um, you know, what should investors be thinking about volume? Cause a lot of times th this was the other thing I learned is that your investors never know how many you turned down or moved through to get to the one that worked, right? They just see the one that you call them about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so as I said a few minutes ago, right now we do two to three houses a month. We're in a small market, 40,000, but so that ends up being about 30 houses a year. Average profit is 78,000. Those numbers work out. Okay. Um, so, how many leads do we have to look at before we actually buy an actual house or a property? Well, it depends on the lead source. So we do a lot of pay-per-click Google pay-per-click, uh, ads that drive. So the majority of our deals that we do, obviously they're not in the multiple listing service, right? There's nothing in the multiple listing service. There's no inventory. Uh, and speaking of inventory, I'll come back to the lead source in a second. Um, I'm in a mastermind group and we had a keynote speaker address us week before last. He is brilliant. His name is Jason Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N. If you're not following Jason Hartman, I recommend you do. He's got a fantastic podcast. Brilliant. He is a forecaster and, uh, I mean, he nails it. And one thing that he told us about inventory, uh, that I, I had never thought about it this way. He says, we are going in the nation, we are going to have a shortage of housing inventory for a long time for more than one reason. But one reason he said, stop and think about it. All those people in the recent years that got those 3%, two and a half percent, three and a half percent, four percent, even 5% mortgages. They're not going to sell their house. If they sell their house and go somewhere else, what kind of mortgage rate are they going to have today? They're going to be hanging on to that stuff. So, uh, and he listed a bunch of other reasons as well, but with the shortage of inventory, if you are a real estate investor, uh, where are you going to get your leads? Well, it's going to be off market houses, right? It's going to be the older population that are looking to downsize or perhaps, you know, baby boomers, they're getting older and older and older. I mean, the, the demand for, um, assisted living and the like is just going to grow and grow and grow. So those houses are going to be coming on the market. Those that's going to be a big market to where you have the opportunity. But anyway, back to lead sources, um, Lead sourcing, uh, I do a lot of pay-per-click, as I said, Google ads. I do a lot of Facebook ads. So, you know, how many people have I got to talk to? Well, it actually depends on where the lead source is coming from. If it is a Facebook ad, I am having to get between 15 and 20 Facebook leads of a Facebook ad to actually buy a house. On the other hand, if I'm getting a Google lead, i.e. a pay-per-click lead, I'm only having to get like seven of those leads to buy a house. So again, it all depends on the lead sourcing. And again, it's those for sale by owners as the actual deals that we're actually closing and buying. Well, Jay, that's super helpful. And I think that a lot of times what we talk about on the show is one, you really brought this up is that you're investing in the operator, the sponsor, right? Do they know what they're doing? And then two, does the sponsor operator have their own sources, right? Where are they getting their leads? Like if they're just out there looking at a loop net, it's way too late, right? <laughs> you know, they, they need to see things that are coming in, you know, in the market sooner rather than later or before everybody else. And, and there are ways to do that, but you have to be an experienced operator in the market because there are a lot of deals, especially as, as the market turns, there are a lot of really well-known big brand players that have some property that they have to liquidate and they want to do that quietly. They want to do it behind the scenes. They have trusted brokers that they work with. And those trusted brokers have trusted buyers that they know can complete the deal and they can get them done before it hits the fan. Right. And then it goes to the bank and it becomes public. 
So that's happening right now as we speak. So you know, knowing who your operator is and does your operator have the sources? And like you, you've got you know, a really unique, I don't know if we really had, may have had some of that back when I was doing the single family stuff, but it was just coming online. I think that's fascinating. But Jay, is there anything else that you think we should, would be worth sharing to make this episode complete for our listeners out there that are trying to figure out how to invest in this market? Absolutely. So if you are listening here to the limited partner and you're a real estate investor and you want to be an operator and you actually want to raise private money and work with potential private lenders, then I'm so excited about this private money guide that I recently finished writing. It's called Seven Reasons Why Private Money Will Skyrocket Your Real Estate Business and Help You Build Incredible Wealth. If you want to raise more money than you can actually put to work, this guide will put you on the fast track to private money. You can download it absolutely free by going to www.jconnor, and I'm an E-R, not an O-R, jconnor, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. Again, that's jconnor, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. Download my private money guide to get on the fast track to getting and raising all the private money you would want for your real estate bills. Well, that's awesome. And thank you for sharing that with, with the audience. And we'll put that in the show notes too. So if you guys need just a clickable link, <laughs> it'll be in the show notes for you. But Jay, we, we finished every episode with a little bit of gratitude because none of us got to where we are today without somebody giving us a leg up and probably a leg up we didn't deserve. So I want to give you an opportunity to give a shout out to somebody or a couple somebodies that maybe helped you out along the way that maybe you haven't had a chance to, to acknowledge publicly before. Absolutely. Well, my shout out would go to the one and only Ron Legrand out of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, we had been in the business for those first six years, 2003 to 2009, lost my line of credit. And it was actually Ron Legrand that told me about private money, taught me about private money, told me what it was all about and all the creative financing uh, strategies as well. So uh, Ron Legrand has taught me more about real estate investing and everything that goes along with it, including private money than anybody, anybody else on the planet. Well, that's awesome. I'll, I'll second that shout out. Ron Legrand had a big impact on my, my investing career as well. And for those of you that have, have never interacted or read Ron Legrand, I mean, it might seem a little antiquated now, but I mean, all of his concepts are spot on and the way he approaches businesses is fascinating. But Jay, thank you so much for being on Limited Partner. We appreciate you being here. Jay, thank you so much for having me. God bless you. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'd actually love for you to contribute to a future episode. If you have a question you'd like answered or a topic or a guest to bring on the show, please email me at jake at thelimitedpartner.com. Now I realize there's a lot of lingo that's thrown around on these shows, so I've created a cheat sheet for you with the top 26 terms that come up most often. Head on over to thelimitedpartner.com forward slash lingo for the list. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.